from Swiss Liver Patients Association, SwissEPA. Today with the presentation from Professor Dr. Annalisa Perzigotti, Senior of Hepatology at the Inselspital Bern, at the topic cirrhosis. Welcome, Professor Perzigotti. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bobson, for this kind invitation to discuss the topic liver cirrhosis in the context of this very nice initiative of the HEPA Patients Association. The topic is very large and I will try to give you a short overview focusing in particular on what you can do to improve your health if you have liver cirrhosis. Just to, to start with, I think it is good to remember what is the natural history of chronic liver disease. The natural history of chronic liver disease starts uh, with factors inducing chronic liver damage, such as alcohol, viral hepatitis C or B, non-alcoholic or metabolic fatty liver, autoimmune liver disease, or iron overload, for instance. This induces a progressive inflammation of the liver and formation of uh, scar tissue, which we call fibrosis, which can last many, many years before reaching the stadium of liver cirrhosis, which is the consequence of what happened in the previous, usually 20 to 25 years. We call liver cirrhosis then this late stage of chronic liver damage, which is featuring from a histological point of view, nodules of liver cells, which are trying to regenerate, surrounded by scar tissue. The organ progressively becomes smaller and nodular in surface and stiffer over time. And it is important to note that usually in a normal situation, not cirrhotic, the liver is a soft organ where the venous flow, so the blood flow coming from the intestine and bringing nutrient rich blood into the liver can reach easily the liver cells. And you see here on the right, uh, the standard normal tissue in a normal healthy liver. And you see how it is well structured and how the vessels get very close to the liver cells. In cirrhosis, this cannot happen any longer because this fibrosis, so scar tissue, prevents blood flow to reach correctly the liver cells, creating a barrier. So you can imagine more or less the liver with cirrhosis like a stop in the portal venous circulation, which of course will induce consequences. And the first consequence is that in the portal vein, in this large vein, bringing blood from the intestine to the liver, there will be an increase in pressure trying to overcome the obstacle due to the high resistance opposed by a stiff cirrhotic liver. However, since liver disease is anyhow progressing during this situation, also the increase in pressure is not enough to overcome the problem. And we have the consequ consequences of what we call portal hypertension, so high blood pressure in the portal venous system, which on one side is the increase in spleen size because spleen is connected to the portal venous system. And as a first consequence in time, you will see a low blood cell count. Then new veins will try to form from the portal vein to the main circulation of the body, trying to create a lower obstacles or lower resistance bypassing the liver. And these are called collaterals or varices, and we can find them frequently in the esophagus or in the stomach, and we have to look actively for them. The second consequence is that, as you can imagine in a situation like we are now seeing in the picture, lower flow, 
lower blood reaches correctly the liver cells, which are below the obstacle. Therefore, the functions of liver cells are reduced, and you can see a lower synthesis of protein, like albumin, or the proteins that are the factors for coagulation. You have as well a reduced detoxifying function of the liver, and we will see what are the consequences, and you have a lower filter against bacteria. Moreover, liver cells try to regenerate to improve all these functions, but in a way that unfortunately is not enough. What does this mean for you, for patients? Well, these two consequences, so portal hypertension, high pressure in the portal vein, and reduced liver function will induce some consequences over the long term, which are accumulation of liquid in the belly, in the abdomen. So we call it ascites. You can see it as a rapid increase in body weight, but uh, um, uh, you can see also your muscle reducing during time. So it's not really weight you are, weight we are putting in, but water. You can have bacterial infections in the liquid of the abdomen or in general in other organs, like for instance, urinary tract infection, cellulitis, pneumonia. During this complication, you can get yellowish, and this is what we call jaundice. You can have neurological problems associated with confusion and changes in your personality up to coma, which is not frequent, but is of course, one of the possibilities, we call it hepatic encephalopathy, and this is due to intoxication, let's call, from products in the intestine that are not correctly managed by the serotic liver. Then the varices we were talking about in the esophagus and in the stomach can increase inside, rupture and bleed, and you can see blood in stool, or very black stool, which we call melena, or you can vomit blood, and this is an emergency. You will have to go to the emergency department in this case. And in the middle term, the regeneration of liver cells can lead to a risk of liver cancer. And this is why you have to be sure to keep every six months on ultrasound as a screening. It is also important to know, however, that this complication occur late in the history of cirrhosis and that the first part of the history of cirrhosis is asymptomatic and you can maybe find a bit of tiredness and low placid counts, but you are fully compensated, as we say, so not yet with clinical consequences. The consequences come later on when portal pressure is very high, and they are usually, as we said, ascites, uh, varicial hemorrhage, and uh, later on, an accelerated course of the disease, which can cause death. And of course, we consider liver transplantation early enough when you have um, complications of the disease or liver dysfunction, since a transplantation can be life-saving. We can use many tests to diagnose your liver disease and to stage it, to know exactly at which point of the disease you are. We use laboratory tests, we use ultrasound, we use elastography, we use magnetic resonance or CT, we check for the strength of your muscle with a simple hand grip test, we can look for viruses with endoscopy and sometimes liver biopsy and measurement of pressure in the liver veins is needed and we might ask you to have these procedures. What can we do? Can we cure cirrhosis? Unfortunately, nowadays we have no uh, specific drugs to cure cirrhosis, but what we can do is cure the cause of liver disease if we have available treatment like for hepatitis C or viral suppression for hepatitis B. And we have to prevent, however, the complications to occur. So we might give you medication for the specific high uh, portal pressure or if you have uh, some liquid in the abdomen. But we also have to try to reduce the cofactors of disease that can help the disease st stabilizing or even regressing 
in some occasions. The most important factors that we have to control for is alcohol consumption. Alcohol is prohibited in cirrhosis because even small amounts are dangerous and can progress liver disease. And another important point is to keep your body weight in a healthy status, which means not malnourished, since malnutrition worsens liver disease, but also not obese, because obesity as well inflames the liver and leads to a progression to decompensated stages. So this is important for you to know because you can help yourself in helping your uh, health for your liver by avoiding alcohol, also reducing the consumption of some specific substances or uh, nutrients like salt, for instance, is not good for your liver health because it can uh, induce a higher accumulation of fluid in the abdomen and you should try to have a healthy diet with much uh, proteins and uh, enough calories. You can have the uh, help of nutritionists sometimes and you can receive supplementation when it's not enough but even just a good healthy diet with rich in calories and proteins, if you are not obese, is important. You can drink coffee and tea, and they are protective against liver cancer. And you can take advantage of physical activity, which is excellent to keep your health um, good, not just for the liver, but also for the liver. Other measures that you can take are explained in the brochure that is available on the website and in the insulge spital. Important for us is that you take note of your hospitalization, you write them down and you have a clear dossier that you can show to, the, to us during the visits and you come regularly to the visits at least every six months for receiving your ultrasound for screening of hepatocellular carcinoma. Take the medications we suggest regularly and report to your doctor in case of new symptoms. Early enough, don't wait. Important is that the liver and the kidney are delicate in patients with liver cirrhosis, so try to avoid medications that can be toxic for you. Among them, the non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen, so the painkillers can be very dangerous because they compromise kidney function, so avoid them. Paracetamol cannot be taken more than two grams per day and avoid, in general, medications that you did not consult with your doctor. This is for me all at the moment. We will for sure in the future enter much more in detail into each complication, but my final message is that as doctors, we need your help. And if you take care of yourself, not just with medication, but also with lifestyle changes, we can better take care of you. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Professor Betsy Gotti for the instructive and exciting presentation and your great personal commitment. Thank you very much, Professor Betsy Gotti. <music>